On February 20, 1943, near the Kasarin Pass in Tunisia, German tank commanders witnessed something extraordinary. American Sherman tanks executed maneuvers that went against everything German tactics expected. Despite being separated by rough terrain with no direct line of sight between them, five Sherman tanks advanced toward German positions with such perfect timing. It seemed almost supernatural. No flags, no signal flares, and no riders rushing between vehicles. Yet they moved as if they were one unit. Each tank knew exactly where the others were and covered each other's blind spots. German tank commanders and their Panzer IVs, equipped with outdated radios, struggled to hear even their own officers. The German radios, while advanced for their time, were limited by static, and their transmitters, which were only 10 watts, couldn't transmit over long distances, especially when tanks were moving. Most German tanks only had receivers, meaning they could hear but not send information or request help. On the other hand, the Americans were using technology the Germans didn't even know existed. Every Sherman tank was equipped with frequency modulation, FM, radios, clear, precise, and much more powerful, at 25 watts of transmission power. These radios cut through the noise of battle like a knife through paper. While the Germans struggled with static and poor range, American tanks communicated clearly, no matter how noisy or chaotic the battlefield became. This technological edge, made possible by advancements in FM radio, was not just in the armor or firepower, but in the invisible waves connecting each tank crew seamlessly. This transformation began in July 1941 when the U.S. Army standardized the SCR-508, SCR-528, and SCR-538 radios for medium tanks. While the Germans were advancing in Russia, relying on their radio communication systems, American engineers at Galvin Manufacturing Company, later known as Motorola, were perfecting FM radio technology. The team, led by Daniel E. Noble and Henrik Magnoski, worked to create radios that could withstand the tough conditions inside a tank. Their product, weighing 181 pounds, turned each Sherman tank into part of the world's first mobile battlefield network. The BC-604 transmitter, generating 25 watts, was 2.5 times more powerful than the German FUG-5 radio. It operated on frequencies between 20.0 and 27.9 MHz, with 10 preset channels. The system allowed commanders to listen to multiple frequencies at once, a feature that proved invaluable. The real breakthrough was FM technology itself, which eliminated the static that plagued older radios. While German radios struggled to separate noise from voice signals, American FM radios provided crystal clear communication, even during artillery fire. When American tanks arrived in North Africa in November 1942, as part of Operation Torch, their SCR-508 radios were already showing their superiority. The German Africa Corps, despite being highly experienced, suffered from serious communication problems. Only a few tanks in each platoon had radios capable of transmitting and receiving. The rest could only listen. This meant that German tank units struggled to coordinate and respond, especially when their command tanks were destroyed. At the Battle of Kazarine Pass in February 1943, this communication gap became evident. While German forces were tactically victorious, they were stunned by the coordination of American forces, who maintained communication across a 50-mile battlefield. American tank crews, many of whom had never worked together before, coordinated attacks, warned each other of threats, and called for artillery support using the crystal-clear FM radios. German intelligence intercepted these transmissions and noted how clear and well-coordinated the American tanks were. The Germans realized that every American tank could transmit information, not just the command tanks. The German FUG-5 radios, operating on amplitude modulation AM, struggled with static, only able to transmit a few kilometers under ideal conditions, and much less when the tanks were moving. Every tank movement, every spark plug firing, and every motor created interference that AM radios couldn't filter out. When American tanks reached Italy in September 1943, the mountainous terrain should have hindered their communication advantages. Instead, the FM technology proved even more useful in these conditions. While German AM radios failed in the mountains, the American FM radios performed well, allowing tanks to coordinate movements even when line-of-sight communication was impossible. By June 6, 1944, when Sherman tanks landed at Normandy, their SCR-508 radios maintained communication with naval support, something German technology couldn't achieve. However, a gap still existed. Tank radios couldn't communicate with infantry radios, as they operated on different frequencies. This caused problems, 
such as when German infantry attacked American tanks while American soldiers couldn't warn them. The U.S. quickly solved this issue by installing field telephones on the tanks, allowing coordination between the two groups. In these critical battles, it wasn't just the firepower or armor that made a difference. It was the superior radio technology that allowed American tanks to function as a well-coordinated unit, while German forces struggled to maintain communication on the battlefield. By the time of Operation Cobra in late July 1944, a simple change in tactics completely transformed how tanks and infantry worked together. From July 25th to 30th, the operation highlighted the full power of American radio technology. The 2nd Armored Division, under Major General Edward H. Brooks, used radio networks to command over 200 Sherman tanks, giving them unmatched control on the battlefield. The German defenders from the Panzer Lair Division faced an enemy that seemed to have an almost supernatural ability to respond to threats. American tanks reacted immediately to information coming from other units, even miles away, and artillery strikes, coordinated through the radio, hit targets just minutes after they were identified. The difference in communication capabilities between the two sides was striking. The Panzer Lair, once one of Germany's most formidable divisions, was severely limited in its communication abilities. Most of their tanks didn't have radios and relied on visual signals in areas where visibility was often under 100 meters. The few radios they did have faced interference and short-range limits that made effective coordination nearly impossible. This was especially ironic because Germany had been the pioneer in using radios in tank warfare. Heinz Guderian, who developed the Blitzkrieg strategy, had recognized the importance of radio communication in the 1920s, stressing it in his 1937 book, Achtung Panzer. However, by 1943, German tank production couldn't keep up with a need for radios. Despite manufacturing 5,700 medium tanks in 1943, only about 2,000 FUG radios were produced, and many went to command vehicles, leaving regular tanks without proper communication tools. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union had even worse problems, with many of their T-34 tanks, despite being the most produced Allied tank, often entering battle without any radio equipment. The Soviet Army relied on flag signals and prearranged plans, which led to disastrous outcomes against German forces in 1941. By 1943, the U.S. began sending radios, including the SCR-508, to Soviet command tanks through the Lend-Lease program, but even by the war's end, only 25% of Soviet tanks were equipped with radios. In contrast, the United States achieved a remarkable feat while the Soviet Union struggled to equip a quarter of its tanks with radios, America outfitted 100% of its tanks with advanced FM radios. Motorola's Chicago factory, once making car radios, had to completely retool to meet military demands. This factory produced over 50,000 tank radios during the war, ensuring every one of the 49,324 Sherman tanks was equipped with sophisticated communication equipment, something no other country achieved. The SCR-508 radios had several advantages. Their crystal-controlled frequency stability allowed tanks to preset channels before a battle, ensuring they remained aligned, even in the chaos of combat. In contrast, the German FUG-5 radios had problems with frequency drift, causing confusion. The SCR-508 also had dual receivers, enabling commanders to monitor multiple communication channels at once, ensuring constant awareness of their platoon and company. The radios worked in conjunction with a BC-606 intercom system, letting the crew alert the commander to threats instantly, with clear communication even during combat. Many German tanks, by comparison, lacked intercoms, making it difficult for crews to communicate effectively. Another advantage of the American radios was their power management. The SCR-508 could run on either 12 or 24 volts, automatically adjusting to the available power, and it used a dynamo motor for stable, interference-free power. German radios, which were powered directly from the vehicle's electrical system, picked up every spark as static, disrupting communication. The widespread use of radios revolutionized American armored tactics. Their flexible command structure allowed commanders to form task forces from different units and still be able to coordinate them effectively, thanks to the reliable radio systems. This flexibility confused German commanders, who were used to rigid structures that had to depend on limited communications. During the Battle of Aracourt in September 1944, the 4th Armored Division faced German panzer brigades with superior panther tanks. Despite the Germans' advantage in armor and firepower, American radio coordination proved to be the deciding factor. Every Sherman tank could immediately report enemy positions, 
even when the enemy couldn't be seen. Tank destroyers received targeting information from other tanks and artillery observers and command tanks called inaccurate strikes within minutes. Over the course of three weeks, the 4th Armor Division destroyed 281 German tanks, losing only 41 Shermans, achieving a 7 to 1 kill ratio. German intelligence reports often noted the coordination of American units but mistakenly attributed it to better training, not the technological advantage of their radios. A report from September 1944 mentioned that American tank units demonstrated good radio discipline and coordination, but it failed to recognize the role of advanced radio technology. German tactics never adapted to the American radio advantage. They continued to focus on destroying command tanks, assuming that the loss of these tanks would disrupt the coordination of American forces, unaware that every Sherman could communicate and coordinate with the others. By March 1945, American radio superiority was at its peak. The capture of the Remagen Bridge in Germany demonstrated how quickly the U.S. could respond to opportunities. When the 9th Armored Division discovered the bridge was intact, radio reports reached 1st Army headquarters within minutes, and within an hour, American units across the front were moving to exploit the situation. German forces, reliant on telephone lines that American aircraft had already destroyed, couldn't respond with the same speed. The American ability to coordinate through radio networks meant that even tank platoons from different battalions could work together seamlessly. German counterattacks, poorly coordinated due to their lack of effective communication, were crushed by American forces who used their superior coordination to form an impenetrable defense. In April 1945, during the encirclement of the Ruhr pocket, American communication superiority reached its peak. The 1st and 9th Armies coordinated a complex double envelopment entirely through radio communications. Inside the pocket, 325,000 German troops were trapped, partially because their communication systems had collapsed. American fighter bombers, guided by forward air controllers equipped with radios, systematically targeted and destroyed German communication hubs. As a result, German units lost contact with their higher command and with each other. Field Marshal Walter Model's final messages, before his communication systems failed, highlighted the German struggles. He reported being cut off from both adjacent units and higher headquarters, while the fighting continued without coordination. For American tank crews, radio communications were a game-changer. Even when physically separated, they stayed connected through radio waves, never truly fighting alone. In contrast, German crews faced isolation. Unable to communicate, they fought individual battles within a larger conflict. Otto Carius, one of Germany's top tank commanders, described the struggles of limited communication in his memoir Tigers in the Mud, though he focused more on tactics than the communication gap itself. The strategic impact of this limitation was clear. American advances in 1944 and 1945 were made possible in part by radio coordination that German forces could not match. The Third Army's swift advance through France relied heavily on radio systems that allowed commanders to maintain control over vast distances. German commanders, unable to imagine the level of American communication superiority, consistently underestimated its effect. Heinz Guderian, responsible for inspecting German armored units, recognized the problem but couldn't find a solution. In December 1944, he acknowledged that American coordination had overcome the German advantage in tank quality. After Germany's surrender, American technical teams assessed German equipment and found what combat experience had already shown. German tanks had better armor and guns but were severely lacking in communication capabilities. U.S. Army Report No. 176 confirmed that German tank radios were roughly five years behind American technology. The absence of frequency modulation, limited radio distribution, and poor electrical interference management left German units vulnerable. Soviet evaluators, after capturing German equipment, chose to adopt American radio designs for their own post-war developments. The production and deployment of American radios was a testament to U.S. industrial capacity. Over 50,000 SCR-508 radios were produced, with every Sherman tank, out of 49,324 built during the war, receiving these advanced communication systems. The radios had a 25-watt transmission power with crystal-controlled frequency stability offering a moving range of 7 miles and a stationary range of 10 to 15 miles. In contrast, Germany produced about 6,000 FUG-5 transceivers, with only about 20% of tanks fully equipped with radios. These radios had only 10 watts of power and suffered from unstable frequencies. Their effective range was only 0.5 to 1 mile while moving, 
and two to three miles when stationary. This communication gap had serious operational consequences. American tanks were able to coordinate artillery strikes in three to five minutes, while German tanks took 15 to 30 minutes to respond. The U.S. tanks achieved full coordination in 100% of cases, while only 20% of German tanks had the communication capabilities to do the same. The superior communication of American forces shaped modern armored warfare principles. Today's main battle tanks still carry systems based on the SCR-508's design, although they are now digital instead of analog. The German Bundeswehr, established after World War II, prioritized communication systems, recognizing that American tank victories were largely due to superior radio coordination. A training manual for the Bundeswehr notes that the defeat of German tanks by American tanks with better radios demonstrated that information superiority outweighs equipment superiority. This lesson has been proven time and again in modern conflicts. In the 1991 Gulf War, coalition forces with superior communication systems destroyed Iraqi forces, which had better Soviet-designed tanks but outdated radios. In 2003, American forces again proved that network-based warfare could defeat weapon-based superiority. The superiority of Sherman tank radios marked a turning point in warfare. The radios turned each Sherman into a component of a battlefield network, connecting every tank crew. This connection created a shared intelligence that no single German tank, regardless of its firepower or armor, could match. The Wehrmacht learned this lesson too late through bitter experience at Kasserine Pass, in the hedgerows of France, and in the final battles in Germany. American tanks, using radio coordination, could perform coordinated maneuvers that German doctrine said was impossible without visual contact. At Germany's surrender, Field Marshal Wilhelm Keitel was quoted saying, We knew how to build better tanks, but you knew how to make them work together. This statement, whether true or not, captured a vital truth. The U.S. didn't just build 49,324 Sherman tanks, they created 49,324 nodes in the first-ever armored battlefield network. The revolution in warfare that modern network-centric strategies rely on actually began in 1942, when the first Sherman tank, equipped with the SCR-508 radio, entered combat. From that point, warfare was changed forever. The side with superior communications would win, not the side with the better weapons or platforms. German forces were largely blind to this shift. They recognized American tactical superiority, but didn't understand the technological foundation behind it until it was too late. By the time the Germans realized every Sherman tank could communicate, the outcome of the war had already been decided. The failure to recognize the significance of communication in warfare is one of the greatest intelligence failures of World War II. Even with superior tanks, the German military's failure to prioritize effective communication left them isolated on the battlefield. In the end, the ability to communicate and fight as a unified force, rather than as individual tanks, proved far more decisive than any advantage in armor or armament. The SCR-508 radios changed warfare, demonstrating that in modern combat, connection equals survival and isolation leads to defeat.